Hi there, welcome to Footyology, gearing up for a big final series just when the AFL reckons it's a great idea for everyone to have a week off. I'm Ron Conley, with me is my co-host, we'll get to that, and we're going to provide you with enough football fodder to stock up for the barren weekend ahead. You'll be soaking up the nutrients and essential vitamins of all our regular segments, each one given a tick by the National Heart Foundation, if not our football fast food competitors. We've got the energy giving properties of hot or not, tomorrow's news today, rounds of our lives, keyboard Q&A, the credibility ladder and the rant off. It's a football banquet, expanding your mind but never your waistline because I've got that well and truly covered. So let's get going as I introduce my mystery co-host and ask what the hell happened to Finey? Well, when it comes to September, Rowan, as you know, it's time to step up and the good players step up and I'm hoping to be Clark Keating of the early 2000s today. It's our news guy, John Perry. <laughs> and welcome aboard. Much better dressed than our usual co-host. And uh, I, I didn't know that uh, footy panel show co-hosts had Mad Mondays, but uh, Finey's obviously had a very large one. And I think it's still going. So yes. uh, we've sent out an APB for him at the moment. So if we can get hold of him, it'd be great to have him back. Well, what was your highlight of the weekend? Has to be Jack Fitzpatrick, doesn't it? That fabulous goal um, against uh, uh, for the Hawks on Sunday afternoon against Collingwood. Sorry, just had a mental blank there. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fabulous back tail to Jack, isn't there? Yeah. He was diagnosed with um, diabetes in his third year at Melbourne. He's had chronic fatigue syndrome. I was at training this year when he um, left training early because he had concussion. He was out for seven weeks. He came off the track that day and felt he may not even play again at that stage. That in was fact, the fear I, among the Hawks. I remember you telling me what, we we, spoke about what that. were his words to the Hawthorne football <laughs> <mate>? <laughs> Probably can't say on TV. <laughs> but uh, he seemed in, in a bit of strife. And then at the weekend, he's, he's returned with the Hawks. They've got a few injuries at the moment. And he's kicked the winning goal. It was just a great tale. Uh, it was a good story. And it set up a great final series. The Hawks, they are the great survivors. And they uh, get a crack at it from the top four. Well, it was a big final round of the home and away season. Some surprises, some stinkers, some also rans going out with a bang and others with whatever it is that's several rungs down again from a whimper. Let's have a look at the pick of round 23 in Hot or Not. Footyology's Hot or Not is proudly brought to you by Trade Institute of Victoria. Start your future today at tiv.vic.edu.au. Okay, well, I was going to get fired to kick us off, but I'm sure you can do just as good a job. Start us off with a Hot. Well, I've already mentioned Jack Fitzpatrick, so he's number one. I also like the Eagles at the moment. They've had big wins over Hawthorne and the Crows in the last fortnight. And Adam Simpson's got a really good game plan at the moment. I think they've changed up the way they um, set up around the ball at the moment. There's a bit more flipping of the ball around through stoppages. They seem to be opening up the play a bit more. So they're definitely a hot team heading into September. Well, the, um, the form line, particularly on the road, I think is the most ominous thing. They were actually they were one win from five on the road earlier in the year. <clears throat> now that's uh, I think five from or four from their last five on the road. So, and their last three wins have probably been their best three of the season, haven't they? G, you know, the last kick against GWS, really good win over Hawthorne, and now Adelaide um, in that last game. So yeah, well, they were, a lot of questions about their hardness early in the season, wasn't there? Just whether they were up to sort of winning on the road and beating the good teams. In the last month, they've got their act together. Yeah, no, good call. All right, my turn. I am going with a hot to start. And it is uh, GWS, who we spoke about briefly. But um, I thought that was a really mature win over North Melbourne on Saturday night. Uh, they needed a win to get top four, and they did. And, and the Roos pushed them at several stages, and each time they responded. They played the better footy. Um, their skills are, are red hot. I don't think their skills uh, want for anything compared to any other side in the league. And look, the experience about them, uh, sorry, the uh, reservation about them in the finals is going to be experience, obviously. But I don't know, there's just a, there's sort of a, a super confidence about them that I, I think potentially can overcome that. So they're not to be taken lightly. Um, they, they get a Sydney derby and they've yeah. beaten Sydney by seven goals last meeting. So, you know, they're, they're two wins away from a crack at a grand final. And for a side and a club playing in its first final series, that's a pretty amazing achievement. So take a bow, GWS. Yeah, it's amazing how far north will fall, and isn't it? Like I think yeah. on the form ladder since round 13, they're in about ninth or tenth, so they wouldn't have actually made the eight. I think St Kilda would have been in the eight just going on that period of time. So I think they've won two of their last 11 games. And yeah, it was nine straight to start the season. Yeah. Yeah, it's all falling apart. All right, your turn. As in a hot, hot or not? Uh, I'd go with a not. <laughs> uh, I'd have to say Melbourne's farewell to Paul Roos. It was terrible, wasn't it? Um, Melbourne has a nasty history down at Skilled Stadium of farewells. Remember the whole uh, 
episode there with Dean Bailey and his final game for the Demons. That was an impromptu um, farewell. That was an impromptu, <laughs> yes. Well, it could have been the end of um, the, sh um, the chief executive at the time as well. That's another story for another day. That was a good um, call, wasn't it? They, s they uh, kept the chief executive kept and sacked the coach. Yep. Sounds fair. <laughs> so, yeah, for Ferruzzi, there was a lot of good stories written about him on the Saturday, um, leading into the game, how well he'd done at the club and turned it around, and all of a sudden there's a 100-point belting, the biggest loss of his coaching career. So that's definitely something that's not hot. And puts a few questions over the demons heading into the preseason and, and where they're really at. Yeah, no, fair call. Uh, you know, I still think the gains have outweighed the negatives, but um, really disappointing end considering they were a, a genuine chance to make yep. the eight. Okay, I've got a, a knot to follow that, and it's of similar ilk, and uh, it's Richmond who uh, talk about waving the white flag. It's hard to decide which of those two performances was worse, but I think you've got to say the Tigers because they just. Stunk. I mean, mm. cop this for a three-quarter time score. 22 goals 11 to two goals eight. Mm. I mean, that, they were just absolutely uncompetitive. You could tell within five minutes of the start of that game what was going to happen. And, you know, they were very lacklustre the week before against St Kilda. So there's no semblance of, you know, finishing off on a good note or giving their fans any sort of hope to go on with. That's about, you know, I reckon that sort of first three quarters against the Swans is about as low as the Richmond Football Club's been for arguably 15, 20 years. Um, it's just it's amazing the extent to which that whole club has regressed over the last six months. Well, Damien Harwick's fortunate he's contracted, isn't he? Like they've mm. got rid of five oh, assistant absolutely. coaches in the last couple of days. There'll be some more changes there. And he, if he didn't have a contract, he'd be out. Yep. Which begs the question, sh should he still stay? Well, I, I think, look, yeah. I think they've got a number of issues. I think recruiting, um, junior development's another one. Uh, I mean, you know, they've sacked an army of assistant coaches. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, that just looks like a symbolic gesture to me. So, look, he, he's lucky. There's no question about that. All right, enough negativity. Yep. Bring us home with a positive one, a hot to finish off. I like how the Saints have gone about their business in the second half of the season. We, we spoke about them earlier in the year, just where they were at, really, in terms of the development under Alan Richardson. And it was great to see Nick Revolt finish the season with nine goals. Um, talking about Richmond and some other teams that really struggled in the final round, Nick really showed that he wants to be back next year. He was already contracted, but he showed he's still got a lot to offer the game, a lot to offer the Saints. Seems as if he won't be captain next year, which is fair enough in what's probably going to be his final year, but he remains one of the premier forwards in the competition. Yeah, good call. Yeah, no, it's been a really positive year for them, I think, and um, certainly go into next season with a lot of hope and expectation, which brings me to my final hot. And it goes to Essendon, the club, and Essendon, their support base. And I can see people rolling their eyes. Well, you're Where's, just your gonna, hey? Where's your beanie? Where's your beanie? You're just going to have to cop it. Where is it? it. It was a good win. They played the most enterprising footy they've played all year. But I thought uh, it was as much about what happened post-game. And I thought how the club uh, conducted itself was brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, they gave the 10 uh, top-up players, a really good send-off. They all marched down to the Punt Road M where most of the Essendon fans were. Um, there were speeches. They kicked mm. footies into the crowd. I hung around out in the ground for a good 15, 20 minutes afterwards. Mm. And uh, it's amazing that a side that finishes a year with three wins does so with such positivity. And it's not all about the return of those players coming back. Um, I, I think it's important. The gains out of this year yep. have been significant both in terms of young players like Parrish, uh, Tip and Woody, Langford put his mm. hand up on the weekend. Uh, one of the top ups, Matt D, has been absolutely terrific. Um, Lewenberger in the ruck, Michael Hartley. You know, there's all these pluses out of the year. I think they've really sort of revived the spirit of the place, mm. and getting the star players back in the lineup is just a bonus. So they'll go into 2017, I think, with more hope than Essendon's taken with them into a summer for a long time. So they are a top eight team next year? Oh, not definitely. And and some people are saying they're a shoe in absolutely no way. I mean, you know, these guys have had a year off. You don't know what it's going to do with them. I still think they lack a bit of midfield depth and perhaps a bit of pace midfield, which ca can be addressed. Um, but no walk-up start by any means. But, you know, look, uh, they're obviously one of a bunch of teams who I think will be serious yep. contenders to improve their ladder position significantly. Yeah, now much to look forward to there. Yeah. All right, time for a short break. When we return, it's been a pretty biggish 24 hours or so for footy news, and we've got just the man to bring you up to date with it. But first, let's get to the post-game press conferences where coaches have 
just about had enough of Grant Dickinson. Unfortunately for them, he can't get enough of them when he strips back the spin and asks instead the pressing questions. Damien, Grant Dickinson from Footyology, I just had Meatloaf on the phone and he said that after your game he's now relieved that his is the second worst performance in front of an AFL crowd. Yeah, I'd probably agree. You know, the way we play, we haven't played well enough all year, so it's probably a fair conclusion. We specialise in building and construction. We're getting students that are coming from interstate. I mean, that, that's real acknowledgement for us. TIV, Trade Institute of Victoria, we're proud of our students. Welcome back to Footyology. Well, in the space of a day, we've had one club second senior coach, another offload a tribe of assistants, and we might just have another drug scandal on our hands. I don't think that was quite the celebration of football the AFL were counting on this week. There's a fair bit happening, and John Perrick's right across all of it all as he tells us, tomorrow's news today. G'day, JP. You look remarkably <laughs> like that bloke in the suit that did the opening segment. Yeah, it's my twin brother. What's his name? Joan. Is he, <laughs> is he evil John and you're good John, or is it the other way around? Yeah, my little finger, yeah. Okay, well, we've got some, we've got some pretty serious news, yeah. so we'll say this is evil John. Uh, give us your best. Yeah, it's not a good time for the Greater Western Sydney Giants. This is heading into their first finals campaign. Um, their talented midfielder, Lockie Whitfield, is under investigation for, te- for allegedly trying to elude drug testers, and with the help, possibly, of Graham Allen and Craig Lambert when they were at the club. This happened last year. The Giants have already looked into it. The AFL is completing its investigation. There's been no punishment handed out yet, and there's still maybe no punishment at all. It was getting to the bottom of that at the moment. Um, text messages from Whitfield's girlfriend have been, haven't helped his case at all. So at this stage, if he, if he had tested positive to a, an illicit drug, which is the allegation, he would have just had the one strike. But as, he's, as the case now is against um, him uh, trying to elude in testers, there's a chance he could be suspended for between two to four years. And that's the same with Lambert and Alan. Okay, a couple of questions here. Do we know, what are the nature of the text messages? Are they like a conversation which implicates him or are they, has she, where's that? Well, I, I haven't seen those text messages and yeah. I haven't seen that, anything about those text messages reported yet. But the issue was um, Lockie went and stayed a night at Craig Lambert's house, who was the welfare manager. The Giants say that was not unusual with players staying with Craig because that, that's his role ultimately. Um, but the implication of why was he staying there that night, um, there was a feeling that he wasn't well and that that's been one excuse given, but there could be a far more to this, so it's a, it's a tricky one at this stage. And the second and more obvious question is, this happened, what, halfway through last, last year? year yeah. Why are we hearing about it now? Interesting, isn't it? Um, there's you know, obviously been a few changes at Collingwood in the last few days and there's a few conspiracy theories flying around and obviously the Giants heading into their first finals campaign. So sometimes these things are a little odd, aren't they, how they well, unfold the big, in the football world? Well, the biggest conspiracy <laughs> theory, and I think fair enough too, is that this is essentially the AFL's club. Uh, this happened over a year ago, and we've heard nothing. Mm-hmm. And they, were, they weren't they were too um, backward in coming forward with information about the previous AFL club drug saga. Why, why have they been so tight-lipped on this one? You're talking about the two Collingwood boys? Uh, no, I'm talking <laughs> about a certain football club in the northern <laughs> suburbs. Yes. It does smack of hypocrisy, doesn't it? To a certain extent it does, yeah. Well, th- these cases are all meant to re- remain private. You know, that's, that's what the players have signed off on. That's what uh, SAD has signed off on as well. So, yeah, it's interesting how some cases tend to um, have a few more leaks. All right, well, big story, another big story, and we'll, we'll touch on this one quickly, mm. but Richmond's just basically offloaded its entire assistant coaching panel. Uh, yeah, Mark Williams, the former Port Adelaide Premiership coach, is one of the five to go. Um, Brendan Lade's another. This has been coming for some time. It was reported sort of earlier in the season when the Tigers are really struggling, as they typically do early in the season, there was going to be a clean out. They denied at the time there was going to be a major review or, or many changes, but that's just far from the truth. And Tigers are in a major clean out mode at the moment, aren't they? Well, we talked about Richmond mm. being at a low ebb. This is real <laughs> Richmond 1980 stuff, isn't it? Yeah. All we need now is someone to dump a load of chicken manure on the doorstep <laughs> at Punt Road. That was Danny Frawley time, wasn't it? <laughs> and recruit Michael <laughs> Laffey, and the, um, the picture mm. will be complete. Um, all right, but a much bigger coaching yep. story, obviously, up in Brisbane. Uh, yes, uh, obviously um, Lions are now on the lookout for a replacement for Justin Lepic, who was sacked on Monday. It was no surprise, really, with a record of 15 wins and 42 losses over three seasons. 
in the end, um, the Lions knew the win-loss record and told the tale, didn't it? You can talk about development or lack of resources or debt and issues like that, but the bottom line is you've got to have some performance on the field. A few games I covered against the Lions this year, Justin Lepich's answers after the game were sort of all over the shop. Towards the end of the season, he started blaming the AFL for a lack of resources and it just wasn't going to cut it. Players, certainly the leadership group, felt it was time for a change. Unsure why the leadership group should have too much power up there, considering right. how many finals campaigns have they <laughs> been in. Yeah. But the change was made and there's several names that have been thrown up and I reckon the Lions should look for an experienced operator, even one who's been a football manager like a David Noble or a Chris Fagan. All right, well, give us, yeah, Chris Fagan's name keeps coming up. Mm. Give us your 3-2-1 in order of uh, blokes you think most likely to coach. I would have said Brett Ratton, if not for his history with Greg Swan. Obviously, mm. um, Greg was CEO of Carlton when they sacked yep. Brett. So I reckon Brett's the next best coach out there. He's certainly rehabilitated himself at Hawthorne, learnt a lot more about the game, and I reckon he'll be a fine coach wherever he ends up next. Um, David Noble's name keeps bobbing up. Lee Tudor's name's been mentioned, Scott Burns. It, it's a tricky one at this stage to sort of determine who could get the gig. Yeah. So we sort of find out what the Lions are really after. Is it, are they prepared to go for a guy that's just had a level four coaching course, or do they really need a, an experienced man? Well, it'll be interesting to see if they go outside the nest, because yep. I think that's been one of the big issues, that it's, it's a bit of a, a boys club up there. and. Yep. Uh, Three premierships in a row is a long, long time ago now, yeah. almost 15 years. All right, well <laughs> done. Um, you'll be joining us back for uh, another segment in yeah. about 10 seconds. Look forward to it. So don't get too <laughs> comfortable. Another break now. When we come back, it's a look at tales of the not too many round 23s of yore. Did you hear Damien Harbour thinks Richmond can make the finals next year? <laughs> Welcome back. Well, I thought we might have a bit of trouble with this segment this week, seeing that in 120 years of league footy, we've only had nine round 23s. But that was selling it short, because while it's only been a recent phenomenon, it's had no shortage of interest and incident. That's the way with footy nostalgia, because like Mike Williamson tipping a grand final draw every other year, so are the rounds of our lives. All right, JP, I know you love your footy nostalgia. Yeah, it's my favourite You're segment a of the week. You're a of the game. Let's get into it. Now, this one goes back to 1994. The venue is Waverley. The teams are St Kilda and Collingwood. Collingwood are in the top eight, and no sure thing. They need to win to ensure their spot in the finals. St Kilda, having a fairly ordinary year, first year under the coaching of Stan Alves, their third last on the ladder. Wins have been fairly scarce on the ground, but they can smell one here. It's neck and neck. Let's cut to the last quarter action. As Shane said, they've kicked six goals in three quarters of football and they've got almost kicked six to win. The hand punches, here comes Woods, here pass to Williams, Williams kicks a goal! Williams kicks his second goal and here come the carrying bush again. Winmark grabs it, here pass to Lockett, Lockett, Lockett! Has kicked the it goes long. Where are you, plugger? Oh, Kelly came out in front. He missed it. He read it beautifully, but he missed the mark. It's taken by Bartley. He's away. This might be it. Yes, it is. From Woods, Francis launches inside 50. McCartney punched away by Shanahan. It came down to Williams. It's on the half forward line for Collingwood. To McGuan. McGuan. John Collingwood's attacking 50. It's out here near the boundary. They've got to get a kick into the goal square. But St Kilda, Burke's got it. He runs it outside 50. Gets a push in the back. Nathan Burke's got the free. Saints are in front by two points. Siren! Oh, goodness me! Great finish. And what else did you notice about that game? Was it the commentary? There's a few blonde tips out there. <laughs> there were a few blonde <laughs> tips. I was still getting a work out in the noise. <laughs> But that was actually the 3AW commentary yeah. provided by Rex Hunt and Shane Healy. And that was when Rex was at his peak, JP. And that mm -hmm. was, I love that last two minutes of commentary. Didn't talk about anything going on in the crowd or plug any reality shows. Fortunately, in those days, there were no reality shows. Mm -hmm. Just good, straight calling of the footy. I yeah, loved it. So do I enjoy that. It was good to 
good to see the Pies, I must admit. They were a team, that I, reckon, I reckon, though, that underperformed in that era. Yeah, they possibly. Could have, had a, could have had another flag. Well, they could have won in 92, and yeah. perhaps they may have had uh, the late Darren Mullane being part of the equation. We'll never know. All right, let's go to number four on the list. Now, pretty recent, two years ago, 2014, the venue's Etihad Stadium, GWS still in their infancy, and it's been another difficult year, only five wins. They're playing the Western Bulldogs, who have also had a difficult year under Brennan McCartney, but it looks like the Doggies are going to scrape up, I think, their seventh win for the year. Well, GWS have other ideas. Let's have a look at a particularly eventful final 30-odd seconds. Liberatore and bangs it long. Stringer! Can you believe it? Green back to the wing. That would have won it for the Dogs, surely. And now GWS might steal it against all odds. Devin Smith loves the big moment. That's the biggest he's ever had. What a win. What a win by the Giants. And what a farewell. Josh Hutt. And apologies to Jake Stringer if you're watching. Jake uh, wasn't uh, one of Jakey's great moments, but uh, Devin Smith didn't uh, mess around with that one. And I remember watching that and thinking, geez, the doggies have had an ordinary year. It just got a little bit worse again. And of course, massive fallout after that. Yeah. I was going to say, it was an eventful end to that game and certainly an eventful few weeks after that with the coach being sacked and, and the captain at the time, Ryan Griffin, leaving for GWS. So. Terrible year for the Dogs, a lot of unhappiness, and but they've rebounded, haven't they, well in the last couple of years? Yeah, and I guess the other side of the coin, you could almost argue that was a bit of a launching pad for the Giants, because yeah. they won 11 games last year, and uh, this year top four. So pretty. I think the Giants will look back on that as a fairly significant moment. Okay, let's go to number three on the list. And again, the venue is Eddie Had Stadium. The year is 2011. Essendon are in the top eight, but no sure thing to stay there. They've got to keep winning. Port Adelaide, they've had a wretched season. They're on the bottom of the ladder. They've only had two wins. Well, what do you know? Port, flaky even uh, back in 2011. They come out and play some fantastic football for three and a half quarters. 34 points up with only 13 minutes left of play. Did they cruise to a comfortable win, John? Unsure. I don't think they did. Let's see. Oh, six from those marks. Big, big gap. Monfries to Collier. 45 out. Collier to the open. Goal squared. Two and 30 seconds. The Bobbers are back. He's looking to go forward with multiple players. The kick goes into Welsh. Welsh with a juggling mark has marked it. He gets up, plays on. Jenner's in the goal square by himself. He'll kick the easiest of goals. Back to 10 points. Some clean ball, here's Collier again, in the middle of the ground, he taps it out in front of Ebert, keeps his feet, gives it on to Kyle Hardingham, 60 metres out, Hurley at the back has taken the mark! Trailed by 34, 12 minutes ago, they now lead the Bombers by four! Love it, Murray, another clearance, Hill, wobbly ball, Mon freeze! For a 10-point Bomber lead, there he is! The bend, the bombers irresistible. Pretty fair comeback. Some uh, names from the past there, Angus Montfries. Actually, Travis Collier, who you saw in a couple of those clips, that was probably one of the first games he showed some signs. And speaking of those suspended players, he'll be one very welcome back to the fold. You think so? Well, what's he going to provide? Uh, pace. Yeah. A uh, few goals. Uh, he was having a great season yeah. last year until he got injured, and of course, who knows what he might have done this year. Yeah. But uh, anyway, there's another decent yeah. day for the Bomber fans. All right, let's go to number two. This one's for you, JP. I dug it out especially for you. The year is 2013. Essendon have been thrown out of the final series, and so the final spot in the eight and the finals, which begin the following week, is down to a race in four. The contenders are Carlton, North Melbourne, Adelaide and Brisbane. Carlton can make a finals appearance their own if they can beat Port Adelaide in Adelaide, and that is no easy task. They're five goals down at three-quarter time. It looks like they've blown their opportunity, but let's have a look at what transpired. Gibbs runs for him, he ignores Gibbs, goes wider. Yaron, this is his moment. Takes them on and drives it home. Centering kick. Great. Pick Good up. pick on the run, Menzel. Oh, to White. To Arnfield. Too quick. Eddie Betts. 
Well, it's not really three or four, is it? Because it started halfway through the third quarter. They just couldn't kick the goal. It wasn't happening on the scoreboard. You're right. Corns, good bump, Dagen. Took him down, took him down fair. Bell bangs it to full forward. It's long. It's there. For the first time today, Carlton in front. Bangs it inside 50. Just a free kick. The only thing that can stop them. In your dreams, Carlton fans. Well, what a fantastic win from the Blues, JP. Did that uh, fill your heart with joy? It was a good year, wasn't it, 2013? Well, of course, the best was yet to come, wasn't it? <laughs> they shouldn't have made the finals, though. Obviously, what the happened when they did? Out and it was one of the great days, wasn't it, the win, win over Richmond? Yeah, well, they were five goals down in that game, too. Yeah. So uh, I had a real feel of a grand final day, actually. Yeah, funnily enough, feel. I wonder yeah. if, in, re- in hindsight, they perhaps thought they were a bit ahead of where they actually were after that, that finals win and, and that comeback, just getting there, and who knows? They're back, uh, back at the drawing the board one, now. Yeah, it was a few years earlier, the Blues, I think, thought they were a bit further ahead of them where they were. It's been a couple of yeah. false starts. Well, yeah. All right, number one, and I know we've been getting into your Tiger fans, but this one is for you. It's ANZ Stadium 2014. Richmond has got off to one of the worst starts to a season of all time. They are 3-10 after 13 games. Cannot possibly make the finals, can they? But they begin winning. One win, two win, three wins, four wins. And so they mount up and up and up. The victories keep coming. They win eight in a row. They get to the final game of the season, playing the Swans, who are top team in the ladder, needing a win to make the finals. Can they do it? Let's find out. Level. Sydney has really got an ascendancy at the moment, but they're not getting a reward for effort. Can they find a way out, Richmond? Maybe they can. Thumping kick, Edwards. It might come down to Dustin. Oh, oh, Dusty, Dusty, Dusty. He's gone inside 50. He has a look behind. He steadies. He makes sure of it. Did you see that? Manchesky, clever. Shaw, Rampy. They're coming again and again, but again and again. This man takes the mark. He just keeps on giving it. Rance. He's on one leg, but he's still holding them at bay. 17 agonising seconds left for the Tiger fans. They've endured so much heartbreak, but maybe it's there for them here. Marich, oh, oh no. one chance. It could still come. Jones working back. Rowan, can they get their act together? Oh. The Tigers, they can. They can, you know. Flossstone kicks it. Rebound takes the mark. It had to be Jack who had the ball at the end. Fantastic effort by him, wasn't it? Good days for the Tigers. Well, that was, unfortunately, what happened the following week. Do you remember that one? Smashed. Uh, final against Port Adelaide. Trent Cotchin wins a toss, kicks into the wind. Yep. Not a good decision. I must have taken advice from Ricky Ponting after <laughs> that day. <laughs> Not a good decision, <laughs> Trent. But, uh, look, it was a great effort to get there. And, uh, look, I think we all hope the Tigers can get back to something near those heights. They're a great club and a passionate club. And... Uh, I think the finals miss them, as they miss our two clubs, John. Well, this this year's finals are without the four big clubs. Yeah, I know. Four big clubs, aren't they? Well, so you the third... AFL wouldn't be overly happy with that in terms of crowds and level of interest. They're not. It's only the third time the big four have missed the finals since yeah. 1963. So it doesn't happen it's often. Yep. Let's get to a break. When we return, give us your best football questions and we'll work on some passable answers. Thanks for joining us here on Footyology. Even the finals teams have got more questions about them than answers. We know you lot have too. Send us your best using the Footyology hashtag. And Finey, who's Finey? JP and I will put your (laughs) troubled mind at ease. It's time for Keyboard Q&A. Okay, here's how it works, JP. Six tweets. They go up on the screen. My eyesight's too stuffed to read the names. So you read the names, I read the tweets. Let's go. Who's that from? From Paul. Okay, he says, if a high percentage of the game is played between the years, then why is it inconceivable that players can lift? 
for, for milestone, milestone games. games. <laughs> I'm struggling with this. Um, that's a good question because I don't know. Look, at, it'd be interesting to know in big milestone games how uh, results have gone win loss because I, I can remember plenty on both sides of the equation. Well, we saw with Matthew Pavlich this season, didn't we? When he was three fiftieth, and yep. they were belted that day. Then on Sunday, they gave Jeez. him a, 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 a fond farewell. Maybe Pavlich may played well, and they really lifted. And I reckon the Freo were Montes for that for that win all, all week. Maybe they have to be embarrassed first into mm. doing them the, what they should have done the first time. I don't know. Boomer Harvey's another one. Like he, he's had, I think, something like nine milestone games, um, and the Roos have won them all. Mm. So does that mean? Well, hang on. E every week from now could be his last game, <laughs> couldn't it? That means could the Roos are going to win all the way through <laughs> to the grand final. Yeah. All right, decent tweet. Next one. Okay, let's speed it up. And um, this is from Dole Plunger. Oh, Dole Plunger. Yes, <laughs> one of our regulars here on Footyology. Average cr crowd for Swans GWS clash at ANZ, less than 23,000. Are the AFL kidding themselves thinking they'll get 50,000 plus? Uh, I don't actually, Dole Plunger, and I, I, yeah. I'm a bit cynical sometimes about the whole GWS thing, but you couldn't help but notice on um, Monday morning, uh, both the Sydney Morning Herald and I think the Daily yeah. Telegraph had a story and a big picture of that final on yeah. the front page of the paper. Yeah, biggest game in New South Wales football history. It was yeah. branded at the time. So I think they have to get 50,000. If they don't get 50,000, it's a disgrace up there. Like it, They should get the Chard Chardonnay set. Yep. From Eastern Sydney, should yep. make the trip out there. And what? Are and then the, the working GWS class <laughs> out from Penrith should all be heading down the highway as well. But fifty thousand for a, a, a Sydney derby—it's just imperative. Yeah, it's, I still think it's a pity it has to be at the cow paddock. To be honest, mm. I, I mean, what, what's the capacity of the SCG these days? Isn't it about forty? Yeah, it's about forty. Yep. I, I would have taken the reduced capacity yep. and at least. Had it at a decent yeah. ground. And plus, at atmosphere as well. Well, plus the yeah. Swans have got a fair argument about deserving a home yeah. ground advantage, seeing they finished on top. So, yeah. strange decision. Um, plus again, the press box at ANZ Stadium is so sterile. The windows don't open, so you never get a real feel of what's going on. Well, that's the most important yeah. thing, of course. Uh, I remember <laughs> the old press box at the SCG used to be right behind the, the goals. Yeah. And that famous plugger preliminary final in 96, I was able to watched Darren Creswell kick the goal, tied the scores, and it swung about three feet in the air, and I slammed the phone down on the desk back in the days when we were phoning through our copy. All right, next tweet, please. It it's is from... From Brian Arbuckle. And he asks, I'm going to lean forward here, clubs talk about playing kids. Should the AFL develop second-tier comps better to get players more ready to go? Uh, I'd... I'd argue they're pretty ready to go. I mean, I, I, out of the most recent crop of draftees, can't tell you off the top mm. what percentage have played senior footy. But, uh, you know. Certainly the first round selections are playing senior football earlier. The well, development of clubs is better. And the VFL as well, for instance, here, or the Sandfall, the Waffle and the like, their development's pretty good. I guess there's always been talk about raising the draft age and whether it should be more 19-year-olds rather than 18-year-olds, or that's, that's some kind of mechanism there. But on the whole... I think it just comes down to clubs and how much they're prepared to invest in their development. Yeah, and we've seen plenty of, I mean, Callum Mills and, uh, say, Darcy Academy. Parrish, yep. two yep. really good examples. Yeah, all the clubs, yeah, they've got all their academy zones these days. That's really ramped up in the last few years. So yeah, yeah. I think it's, I think oh, it's, it's okay. an inter interesting yeah. question. Yep. Okay, next. This is from our good mate, Ed Healy. Ed asks, why would any club recruit a 29-year-old who has the yips in front of goals? Hashtag cloak. Uh... Well, there's three know. teams firmly in the running at the moment from the sounds of things. Yeah. yeah. North Melbourne and the Dogs being two of them. So Richmond. And, and Richmond as well. Yeah. yeah. Interesting I, if he goes back to Richmond, wouldn't it? Because oh, David, David went back to Richmond and finished his did, career there. Yeah. in 1991. A yeah. massive gamble for Richmond, I think, just given the sort of recruiting mm. they've specialised mm. in the last couple of years. Oh, look, I don't mean this in a nasty way, but he's a bit of a head case. I mean, no, that is nasty. He, he relies so heavily on confidence, yep, doesn't he? He does, and, yep. uh, He's spoken about that, yeah. You know, we saw in the game against GWS, you know, he was terrific. And then, you know, if he doesn't clunk a couple early mm. or kick a couple early, you just wonder where mm. it goes. But, I mean, the, the raw football talent is still mm. there, isn't it? Yep. I've wondered at times whether um, he's sort of flexible enough now and perhaps even mobile enough to... to Play as a key forward the way the game is now, but well, I think he's going to have to change his body shape over summer. Yeah, he's touched on that as well. But if you put him in a dogs forward line with Cremary, Redpath, Stringer, 
Boyd. Boyd, well, and possibly Cloak. I don't think all, f all four could play in inside 50. No, it'd be, but fairly, be fairly top yeah, Pretty handy forward line, though. Yeah. yeah. No, it'll be interesting to see Playing who's... Playing as, you know, as a third man, third man yeah. option sort of thing. Well, yeah. we'll see who's prepared to have a nibble and yep. what they're prepared to put on the table yep. for him. OK, a couple of tweets left. This is from... Christian Amenta. Who asks, how can Merritt and Cripps not be in the All-Australian squad and the questionable Toby Green did make it? Um, yeah, look, I had a look through the numbers last mm. night, actually. Merritt uh, in the top 10 for disposals. I think he's ninth. Cripps leading the AFL for clearances and contested ball. Mm. And their age, too. It's Yeah, look, it's a little bit puzzling. I think there's a couple of mids in there who are probably lucky to be in ahead of those two. And yeah. Tom Scully might be one of them. I think Cripps suffered through the amount of handballs he does. I think he's like averaged about 18 handballs a game compared to about seven kicks, seven to eight kicks this year. His kicking efficiency was about 55%. Sort of a bit of a question on the metres gained he's, he's providing. I know it's bloody hard work getting the ball in the heat of battle and the stoppages, but perhaps he just needs to add that little bit of a layer of a run to his game. No, fair Step point. Yep. Just quickly, Toby Green too. His numbers are really, really good. In fact, uh, I was comparing him with Cyril Rioli and mm. the only category in which he compares obviously unfavourably to Rioli is tackles mm. in terms of scoreboard impact, uh, disposals. He, he's, in fact, even a little bit ahead mm. of Cyril. So he has had an amazing year, mm. Toby Green. And once again, he is a warm and wonderful human being. Reminds me so much of Ben Cousins, the way he plays. Yeah. See that arch back and his chip kicks and yeah, his yeah. Pace, yeah. and uh, doesn't lack confidence certainly. Yep. Okay, last tweet coming up and it is from it's from can, Nick. From Nick, I think I can read that one. Is the Thursday final the AFL covering up their mistake that is the bye week? Uh, good conspiracy mm. theory. I like a good conspiracy theory. I think they were talking about the Thursday night final a few weeks out. Um, yep. I don't know. I, again, look, I'm going to talk about this later, but the, the whole concept of the week off, I think, has been really uh, ill thought out. And also, I mean, Gil McLaughlin's reaction the other day talking about, well, now we'll be talking about the finals coming up mm. for a week. Well, no, we're not. We're talking about coach sackings, tradings, mm. um, yeah, everything but the final. So yeah. it, it hasn't worked out. What do you think about a Thursday night final in principle? I don't mind it in principle. They needed it this, this year for sure. Yeah, they couldn't have two full weeks of no games. Waiting to a, a fortnight for a Friday game. It makes sense to have it on a Thursday night. It's a good viewing night as well. It's got the feel of the weekend. Um, viewership for the Thursday night games through the season have been really high. So yeah, it makes sense to have a Thursday night final. I don't yeah. mind it. I don't mind yep. it. We'll, uh, we'll be setting a precedent. Let's see what happens with it. All right, thanks for your uh, input again, everyone. Another break now. Coming up next, who is the most credible team, not of round 23, but of the entire 2016 season? Stick around and all will be revealed. Um, if you get the sack, do you think you might have to go back to your home building business and back start home. again? Yeah, I've got no alternative. But um, we don't rebuild, but we restart, we rewire, we replumb. Welcome back. Well, every week on this show, we've brought you our own ladder based not just on wins and losses, but which teams made our hearts sing and which teams, frankly, sucked. So now it's time for the big one. Based on the whole season, brace yourselves for the final credibility ladder. Now, oh, there's that tradesman again on top of the ladder. You know when you ring a tradesman and they don't turn up? Regularly. Mm. That's so why I end up having to do it myself. Yeah, sounding, things start to fall apart. Sounding familiar. <laughs> you got a quote for me? <laughs> All right. Let's get well, to it. Okay, th this is uh, a very important credibility ladder. This is based on the entire season. And we're going to do it differently today. We're going to start at the bottom. Who is the least credible team of 2016? I think there are five contenders, JP. Yep. I think they are Port Adelaide, mm -hmm. Flaky again, Gold Coast, <laughs> Starter Well. Had a little patch towards the end, but mostly stunk again. Brisbane, basket case. Richmond, what can you say? Three finals appearances in a row and then dropped the ball completely. But frankly, and I'll, I'll yep. take some argument here, but I think the runaway winner of the least credible team of 2016... 
Dunno. Is the Fremantle Dockers. <laughs> <laughs> no argument from me. Terrible, weren't they? From a team that was contending for the flag last year to finish where they did. Just the heavy defeats and just lack of run and just lack of interest at times. It was odd. It was a disgraceful yeah. season. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's not... Um, Let's not cut them any slack. Mm. They they were playing off for a spot in the grand final. They came out, lost their first ten games, which was unprecedented. Won a patch of three mm. and then dropped the ball again mm. until that last game at the weekend. So, absolutely abysmal. Um, I think there's a group of players there who basically realised they're not going to win a flag mm. now and have found it a bit hard to get on board with uh, Ross Lyons' fairly. Um, strict coaching regime, let's call it. Yeah, I had a few emails yesterday for some readers who kept telling me that uh, kept, don't rule out Ross Lyon heading to Brisbane. Yeah, I've heard that a few times too. But having signed his long-term deal, I'd find that surprising at the moment. And the resources at Fremantle are far more developed than they are in Brisbane. So. Well, he was on good coins, so that yeah. would be a fairly massive yeah, sort of payout, you'd think. He's a f former Lion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very tenuous connection. Homecoming. <laughs> All right, so from the bottom, uh, did we put that up on the screen before? If we didn't, I apologise, we mm. should have. From the bottom, it is Fremantle. Richmond next, pretty hard to argue with them. They yep. stunk it up badly. Brisbane uh, in 16th place. Next, the Gold Coast. And just on top of the Suns, Port Adelaide, mm. the traditional flakiest side of the football I'd probably have Port just below Gold Coast, to be honest. Would you? The Gold Coast didn't do much last year, didn't do much this year. Port were expected to a top eight team this year. David Kosh has made that clear a few times on social media through the season. And look where they ended up. Okay, yeah. our middle tier of teams, and we will be putting this ladder up at the end of this segment. Okay, next lowest. So what are we up to? How's my maths? We're up to 13th and couldn't go past the Magpies, JP. Yeah. Now, uh, some of us got way, way ahead of ourselves. Yeah, someone said they were going to win the flag. Or uh, it wasn't me. It no. uh, wasn't me. Uh, I think it might have been Andy Marr, actually. <laughs> Apologies, Andy, if that was you. I had him top And someone who but... sits here sometimes as well, I think. Uh, was it him? Yeah, it might have okay. been as well, yeah. That tradie bloke. Tradie, that's yeah. it. That's it. Um, I had them top four. I got far too carried away with their mm. NAB challenge for. Funnily enough, I reckon they actually ended the season yeah. looking okay again. That was a really good effort against the Hawks. They did everything but win. Um, they've won the bulk of their games in the run home mm. um, as opposed to their pattern previously. Mm. Uh, and I think they'll actually go into next year. And look, Bucks has put it on the line, which I think yep. is a smart move. Yeah, you know, he clip. knows if they don't make the finals, he's gone. Yep. So it's all, the stakes are high, but, yep. uh, you know, they'll get a few players back from injury. I don't think yep. th things are so bad. Nevertheless, got to be judged on what you've done this year, and it was pretty ordinary compared where, where to... Where are the Blues players. in all this? The Blues are yeah. just above the Pies. Now, yep. I'll let you talk about this. My That's take right. on them was yep. um, seven wins is far more than most of them thought they'd win. Yep. So taken as a whole, I think reasonable effort. Disappointing second half of the year, but you've got to look at the whole picture. Yep. Oh, a lot of people are saying they'd struggle to win three to four games. I think we did story early in the season, didn't we? Who's going to win the most games out of Essendon and, and Carlton? Mm. And at and that stage, it looked pretty line ball yeah. in some people's eyes. But um, yeah, the, the talent's coming through. I think Cripps has had another good year, um, um, Wittering as well. Um, a few concerns though, Cruiser as well, just where he's at. They need, they desperately need some more run in the midfield, they, and desperately need a, a key forward key of some forward. kind. Yeah, who can kick? Who can kick? That, which always helps. <laughs> Yeah. So there's a lot to work through there. And if you look at their list now, compared to, say, four years' time, there's barely going to be a player left on it from now. So, um, yeah, still a lot of work to do there. OK, we're going to run through yeah. the rest of the middle group quickly. Now, apologies, but I had Essendon ahead of Carlton. I think, yeah. given the expectations, lack of yeah. players, I think three wins yeah, was right. a reasonable effort, more than a lot of people thought. Now, next, slightly controversial call, but I've got a finalist, JP, mm. and it's North Melbourne. Given how they started, nine wins in a row, to finish with, mm. what, two out of 11, mm. pretty awful finish to the season. Yeah. And uh, I think there's a couple of teams that didn't make the finals who overall have finished with more credibility. Mm. I'm actually going to tip North against the Crows in, in the elimination finals. Are you? Yep. Based on what? Oh, You're just behind him a tipping. Oh, well, the <laughs> that's always one valid point. <laughs> I just, just feel they might lift for Boomer and Drew and those guys in their, their, their final game. This is it. You know, they've had a week to digest the sort of the ramifications, what happened last week, and they might just get their act together and just go, this is it. I don't expect them to advance past week two, but I reckon they could do a number on the Crows. And if they adopt what the Eagles did last weekend, and Jenkins has another terrible game, yeah, I reckon they're a chance. 
That's a big call. You heard it here first on Footyology, <laughs> and uh, if Adelaide go on to win by 15 goals, you're going to be seeing and hearing a lot You'll more. You'll have a that. new host anyway, so <laughs> you won't have to worry about it. Hopefully. Oh. Well, who knows if we'll have a show <laughs> the way things have panned out today. Um, all right, coming in ahead of the roost, though, I've got the two. Uh, I don't know if you call them big improvers, but firstly, Melbourne. Now, we did pay out a bit on them at the start, and it was mm. a disappointing finish. Nevertheless, they've ended up winning, uh, what, 10 games for the yep. season? Uh, their big best return since 2006 when the last made the finals. finals. Yep. Uh, I think the kids continue to step up. Yep. I think Jack Watts had a particularly good season. Yep. Um, four well, rising star nominees, I think it is. Yeah, so yeah, four or five, lot, yeah. So. Lot to like about yep. where they're headed, and yep. Simon Goodwin takes over now. Yep. So, yep. No, definitely. No, I, I, they should challenge for the top eight next year. They do well in the trade period as well. All right, and on top of this middle group, uh, I, I hope you would agree. I've got yep. St Kilda. I just think they almost doubled their win tally. They yep. won six and a half games last year, up to. Uh, 12 this year? Yeah, 12, yep. 12 wins this year. Some years that's mm. good enough to get you into the final eight. And they yep. finished equal with eighth team on points. And yep. um, good kids emerging. You know, I really like mm. uh, Jay Gresham. I think he looks really exciting. Yep. Jack Stephen just took his footy to another level again. Yep. We saw that forward line uh, develop surprise packets in Tim Membry and Tom Hickey in the ruck. Yep. Um, Jake Carlisle comes back yep. into the mix now. So they've got a yep. bright future, haven't they? Yep. Yeah, Carlisle's back, I think, on September 13 with mm. a lot of the uh, suspended players. So, yeah, definitely got a bright future. And the pressure rises on Alan Richardson, though, doesn't it? Like, you have years of development and you're not expected to make a massive jump. But the time now is for, for them to really start to push for the finals. And interesting to see how he copes and the club copes. OK, so who is the most credible team of 2016? I give you seven contenders. We have West Coast, Western Bulldogs, Adelaide, Hawthorne, Sydney, Geelong, and Greater Western Sydney. Mm. No order there. We're going to sort them now. I am arguing very strongly that the most credible team of 2016 is, in fact, the Giants. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Yep. They've come from outside the eight and all of a sudden top four. Yep. yep. Gone into a first final series in a position of strength. Yep. Uh, 11 wins last year, 16 wins this year. Mm. Uh, plenty of All-Australian mm. nominees. Uh, it's, been a, it's been an amazing year, really. And uh, perhaps we're still sort of soaking in just what yep. an achievement it is. But I think in terms of what was expected and what's been delivered, yep. pretty hard to go past them as the most credible team of 2016. Yep. All right, second, um, and just to piss them off, it's their crosstown Sydney rival, the Swans. Now, I'll put my hand up here. I didn't have them in the eight. How stupid am I? Where were they on your ladder? Had them about fifth. Yeah. yeah was but we I'm thought sure what was going to happen, how, how they ended up last season. But Franklin's come back and he said yesterday he's had his most dominant season in, in, in several years and they've been flying. We thought it was going to be same old Swans, didn't yep. we? But uh, great regeneration. I mean, the yep. kids have come in. Callum Mills has been terrific. Um, you know, Isaac Heaney continues to develop. Tom Papley up forward. And the Stars are all yep. playing well. That that midfield just ticks over with uh, metronome-like uh, regularity. Yeah. It's, They're uh, a lesson for all teams, aren't they, and how to rebuild on the fly. Yeah, yeah you know, it's been a wonderful yeah. effort. So yeah. they're second. Uh, coming in third, and, and probably making a late charge, I've got the Cats. Yep. So plenty of talent, but they had to make it work, and they're a bit erratic early on, but I think really stitched it together pretty well on the finish and they go into their qualifying final against Hawthorne deservedly favourite and I think uh, every chance of going on and winning a flag. Who are you going to pick in that game? Uh, Hawthorne. <laughs> <laughs> so I the Cats are going to have to do it the well, long way. Once bitten, twice yeah. shy with the Hawks. Yeah. So I just think their capacity to, to pull out the big moments. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, look, there's still a week to ponder it but at yeah. this stage I'm, I would be very, very nervous tipping against Hawthorne yeah. in any final. So Cats third. Yeah. Now fourth, I've didn't finish this high on the ladder, but I think given the amount of injuries they yep. cope with all year. Um, Including the captain, yeah. Uh, I, I think the Western Bulldogs yep. have just been wonderfully resilient. They're certainly the most resilient team of the year. Yeah. It's been a great effort. Yep. They've had their trouble scoring as well, yet they've still been racking up the wins. Um, at one stage, I think all six defenders were out, their first yeah. choice defenders. Yeah, the whole, the the whole back line. Yeah, but so great, you know, great yep. tribute to the flexibility and, and depth that Luke Beveridge yep. has basically develop so well done doggies and yeah. hope, hopefully they can make a fist of it in Perth uh, alright final three Adelaide shouldn't be undersold first mm. year coach Don Pike 
yep. still dealing with the the trauma, I guess, of the the Phil Walsh yep. tragedy last year, and they've continued to get better. Their forward line's the best in the comp, the most potent in the comp. No uh, danger field, uh, and they've done yeah, without danger field. field. That's yeah. a really good point. Yep. So uh, well done, Crows. Yep. Next, got the Hawks. Mm. As Peter McKenna used to say in the nineties, you just can't ride Hawthorne off. No, well, you can't. What six six wins by nine points or less? Mm. So they're the masters at, at a escape act, really, aren't they? So they've hung yep. about, yep. and uh, below them, but still a chance in this season. West Coast. Yep. Now, some people might say that's a bit low, but I would argue grand finalists last yep. year. Uh, I tipped them to win the flag. I think we expected so more. Yeah. And uh, look, they've come good in the last three weeks, so still yep. a chance. But I think over the bulk of the season. Um, that's about the right spot. So have yeah. a quick look at it. Greater Western Sydney, officially Footyology's most credible team of 2016. Have we and got a prize? Mantle? Hey, Got a prize for them? Ooh, no, I'm not a betting man, really. <laughs> Fremantle, yeah. see that and do something about it. All right, a final break now. Don't go anywhere because we're even more pissed off than usual. Well, I am. And it's you who get the full benefit of it. With the Rubik's Cube in the coach's box, did you get it right? No. Nope. Did you solve one side? Oh, I haven't got any comment to make. I just can't get it right, so I was just giving up trying to guess. And I'm not trying to be evasive, I'm just telling you the truth. Welcome back. Well, we're hanging on by a thread here, in case you hadn't noticed, the extra greys, the dark circles under the eyes, and the grievous bodily harm charges we're going to be on soon if people don't stop pissing us off. But for now, we're going to channel it, or I'm going to channel it, into the diatribe of displeasure, otherwise known as a footyology rant off! Okay, now at this point, <laughs> you're supposed to ridicule me for the way I say rant off. We're going to have to get some soothers for you by the end of this season, <laughs> aren't we? Gus voice <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Butter menthol, there you go again. I got a lousy sore throat. <laughs> Look, mate, one of right, the books, magazines, psychopedias, no nothing. Kids are screaming, I got a lousy sore throat. <laughs> All right, let's get to it. Okay. Let's Count get those in. angry pills. Three, two, one. You've got to give it to the AFL, JP. Normally when they pull one of their standard knee-jerk responses to something, disaster doesn't immediately unfold. That's what's made the first couple of days of this bizarre pre-finals break so impressive. 48 hours since the home and away season ended, and already it's like the season's over and the really important stuff has already started. You know, coach sackings, drug scandals, board challenges. All we need now is someone doing the rounds of the various Mad Mondays to come across another pissed player setting fire to a dwarf, and the entire 2016 season will be just a distant memory. Of course, it's all worth it, though, because we really did need a break so that teams that go straight into a preliminary final can do so having played one game in a month. Just the sort of intense preparation an aspiring premiership team needs. And who cares if the top team finish five games ahead of the side in eighth spot? Why should they get a decent sort of advantage? In fact, who cares if the conditions for the nine most important games of the season have been completely changed as long as we can stop one or two sides fielding a few reserves players in a couple of 198 home and away games that mean a lot less. See, that's the same sort of visionary thinking that saw Melbourne find for not tanking, started a new team in a place no one gives a shit about football and bought Meatloaf to sing at the grand final. Pure genius! Need a fire extinguisher after that. <laughs> well, perhaps, I am. Perhaps, perhaps Brendan from Bowler can hand you his. <laughs> well, the more I think about it, this week off is silly. Yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. We've been reduced to watching old grand finals and stuff on YouTube or old episodes of Footyology. Footyology, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, thanks for your co-hosting yeah. efforts. It's been uh, a very decent... In fact, big round of applause, everyone, for John Perry. <laughs> <laughs> We might have you back again, and uh, that (laughs) tradie guy, well, uh, someone will deal with him later. Uh, Any final words? Uh, Should be a good September. Looking forward to the games finally starting. Okay, that's the sort of cliches we leave to the other footy shows. (laughs) Thanks for watching. We're on every Tuesday at 12pm, live on Facebook, uploaded on YouTube, 7.30pm on Channel 31, Thursday nights on Fox Tells Aurora. You know the drill by now. But never forget, JP, never forget. Like the Easy Beats put it in that Oz Rock classic, Monday evening feels so bad. All those footy shows that nag me. Coming Tuesday, I feel better. Even Finey 
and JP and Rocco look good. I'm giving 360 the arse. Footy classified? Pass. I've got footyology on my mind. Do, 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 do. Gonna have fun in the city. See you next week.